Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey My Mother's Son podcast. Today I'm joined with an old friend, former colleague, you could say, a uh, fellow Berks County resident. He's still in uh, in chilly Berks County as, we rec- as we're recording this. I'm in sunny Florida as we're recording it. Um, but love love having Jerry Moyer on the on the show here. He's a former professional soccer player, college soccer coach, current performance coach, and top of uh, top level athletes. But one of the things we're going to talk about a lot today is he's also a fellow author. So Jerry, thanks for joining me today. Dan, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Like I said, there's I, I have a feeling this conversation is going to go a lot of different directions just with our past history. Um, you know, working together with uh, different soccer camps and just being in youth sports and, you know, sports in general and all that stuff. Um, I have a feeling we're, we're going to go a, a lot of different places on this and take the uh, the listeners for for quite a ride. So, you know, before we get started, though, just, you know, introduce yourself in your own words. You know, who is Jerry today? Yeah, I, I love this first question, Dan. Um, who is Jerry today is different than than what a lot of people might think I might answer. I'm I'm a a 60 year old guy that's a, a dad, a father, um, a coach, a mentor, um, and and real simply a person who loves life. Um, I wake up every day uh, feeling incredibly grateful for another day, and uh, I'm a guy who's still learning a lot about myself and trying to share anything that I have already learned with with anyone who might be the student looking to learn from it. So um, at the same time, I guess I would say Jerry Moyer today is a teacher, a coach, and a student all in one. Yeah, I love it. And I always like adding that today to the end of that question because it it's, it's a different answer than if I'm yeah. just like, so who is Jerry Moyer? Because I think we're always evolving, you know, and I think that's one of the main storylines in your book that we'll get into is just that constant evolution and, you know, the ability to, you know, want to be able to take chances and, you know, and take those leaps and and take risks. But before we get into that, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in your description of yourself is mentor. And, uh, you know, again, I know as a, as a former athlete, current coach, um, you know, we take on that role as mentors, but tell me about, you know, who was one of your mentors as you were growing up and you were out there on the field? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'll, I'll answer the question. I'm, I'm actually putting the finishing touches on my second book and 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 talk a little bit about this. But uh, I'll simply say I started with my dad, um, who has passed away. Um, you know, he he was my hero. Um, you know, he he was the biggest mentor without a doubt. Um, wow, I didn't think I was going to get emotional on this podcast. Um, you know, my brothers, who you know, um, at least I know you know Mike. My brother Mike and Doug were were mentors as brothers can be mentors. And then the big ones that, that jump out at me are my high school soccer coach was a guy by the name of Mr. Ray bus, a legend. Uh, I'll add a legend, (laughs) legend for sure. And a huge influence on, on my life. Um, and, and the biggest one for me arguably would be my Penn state coach, um, was a coach by the name of Walter Barr. Um, most people would know him more for his sons who were NFL field goal kickers. Um, but he, you know, I think maybe it was where I was at 1981 to 85, that 18 to 21 year, I was ready maybe to, to learn some real valuable lessons. And he was the ideal coach for me. Um, I, I would arguably say that my dad and coach Barr might be the two biggest mentors in my life. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about it. And it's funny. You said you didn't think you'd get emotional, but I think, um, you know, after you lose a parent, and again, as everybody knows, like this whole show is dedicated to the legacy of my mother, um, who I lost, you know, back in 2005. And I think no matter what, like there's times where when you start talking about them, like emotions just take over because again, she was a huge mentor for me, uh, as your dad was for, for you. I, I only had the opportunity to meet your dad, I think once or twice at some watch parties that FC revolution had on and Mike made sure he introduced me to him. And, uh, you know, so, so I think, you know, that's one of the things when, uh, you know, whether it's been, you know, a year or almost 20 years after you lose somebody like that, that it'll just hit you totally unexpected. (laughs) And you're like, wait, I didn't think I was going to, you know, I thought I'd have more composure, but all of a sudden when, when you're talking about that and understand the impact that they had on your lives, that it, uh, it can hit you 
um, unexpectedly for sure. Um, but, you know, through their lessons, um, as you ended your playing career and got into coaching, what, you know, what did you learn from them where you understood and kind of, you know, embrace the fact that, you know, you were making a bigger impact on your players' lives than just teaching them how to dribble and, and pass and score a goal and, you know, stay conditioned that you were teaching them life lessons. I mean, what the lessons you learned from them, like how did you pass those on to your players and throughout your coaching career? Yeah. I mean, one of the big ones, my, my dad, um, to sidetrack a little bit, my dad was a laborer at car tech most of his life, huge athlete, had a successful athletic career himself, but um, he was up early in the morning, punched the clock at car tech and came home at four o'clock in the afternoon, exhausted. And um, a hard work ethic is, is the paramount foundational lesson that I learned from him. Um, I've never seen a man work harder in his life. Um and be willing to then use that to, to help us and to help others. Um, so, you know, he, Coach Barr, Coach Buss, um, all three of them, the consistent message was, you know, there's no free lunches. You got to, there's something you want, you got to work your, you know what, off for it. That little three-letter word that starts with an A and has two S's in it. Um, you know, there's just no free ride. So, you know, I, I, I watched them um, and then they did it as well. So it wasn't just something they talked about. They were hardworking people in their own lives and um, good people to mirror. Yeah. yeah and, and it's so true. I, I remember uh, I saw a meme or something somewhere where, you know, it said about there is no elevator to success. You always got to take the staircase. And yeah. and that is so true, you know, and, and I think, you know, sports is such a great way to teach that, you know, like you just can't, get by going through the motions like it it takes the work it takes you know the the stuff when nobody's watching right you know i mean we all as fans see it in the big game in the big time you know but i would tell you know being a baseball guy you know i would say to people you know like hey when when did you know when did the texas rangers win the world series you know and a lot of people out oh, you know in in november and early november i'm like no actually that took place in march you know, that yeah. took place in March and, and for a lot of those players in February, even before they got together as a unit and started working, you know, so there really is no shortcut whatsoever. You, you just have to put the work in and, you know, do it day in and day out. Um, you know, and I, I think that's one of the, the great lessons that, that sports will, you know, always teach us if, if we allow it to, you know, yeah. and I'm sure, you know, you and I have seen, you know, the, the landscape of youth sports change, um, you know, so much over the years that we had been involved. Um, uh, I know, you know, Mike and I have this conversation often <laughs> you know, yeah. about how, sure. how it's changed. It's a different landscape now than what it was before, but then they're like, there's still those nuggets where it's like, all right, you know, one or two of those kids or a handful of those kids like really see it and their parents buy into it. And it's like, all right, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So, um, I think even as things evolve like that, um, there's still those silver linings where, you know, there's enough that get it and, and those will be the ones that, that rise to the, to the top. So, you know, and again, I, I mentioned in, in the intro of it, you know, you went on, you played professional soccer, you played at a high, you know, college level. What, what were some of the lessons you learned there? I mean, cause you know, again, there's, you know, there's a, a finite amount of people who have played, you know, who have gotten paid to, to play kids games and, mm -hmm. and you're, you're one of them. So, you know, what were some of the lessons you learned, you know, at those higher levels, even, uh, you know, above the amateur level? Yeah. I, I, I think it's just maybe a, a bringing it to a sharper point of some of the same lessons. Uh, um, if, if that makes sense. I mean, at, at the highest level, when I was playing professionally, um, and this was talked about in high school and talked about in college, but it was just more pronounced now is you got to bring it every day. <laughs> um, in addition to the hard work that I already talked about, it's it's you literally have to bring it every day. And and if you don't, there's 10 guys to your right and 10 guys to your left that are looking to take your spot. And, um, you know, it's it's my underlying part of that that I learned and try to pass along to it to everyone now today is. Um, you know, you have to decide if this is truly something that you want. And and if it is, then there's a price to be paid. 
Um, and if it's not, that's fine as well. But but if you're telling me you want this, this is what it takes. And and I learned that, you know, again, all the way up through, but at the professional level, it's cutthroat. It's it's you got to perform now. Someone's paying and and they're expecting results. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So, you know, fast forward, um, you know, all these years of of coaching, playing, um, and now as you, you know, get into your sixties, you decide, you know. I want to write a book, you know, um, what was the inspiration, you know, behind wanting to write? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I graduated from Penn state in 1985 with a business degree. I actually enrolled at Penn state in 1981 with a journalism, uh, inspiration. I was a journalism major. Uh, my mom's an English person. She taught us the love of reading, the, the love of language. And, um, so writing a book is something I've always wanted to do. Um, like happens to so many people, I was right there in the middle of it, of, uh, you know, life getting the better of me and something I had planned on doing years and years and decades before, um, finally hit a point in my life where I just said, I have to do this. Um, it was, it was not even at that point, something I conscious, it, it was, a, it was, a I have to do this. It was something inside of me, call it what you may, um, just literally, pushing me in that direction. And, and it wasn't a, a direction I fought at all. I, I ran with it. Yeah. Um, so that, that was the inspiration. Yeah. I, I love it. And, you know, again, being a fellow author, I, I love talking to other people who've gone through the process. Um, and, you know, I've, I've read your book. Uh, my wife's read your book. We both loved it. Um, you know, for those out there, it, it's a illustrated tale. Um, so it's a, a relatively easy read, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I think I went start to finish in about two days, maybe three days. Um, but it really is, you know, the titles, you know, time to fly and the storytellers of, of the book are actual flies. So, but the, the underlying story is just so much deeper than, than that. And I don't want to give too much away because we, we want people to, to go and buy your book as well. So we don't want to be a spoiler, but you know, Tell me a little bit about what, you know, what were some of the things that happened throughout your life that you thought telling this story was so important? Because again, I mean, there's a lot of people who are are very comfortable on the sidelines and not getting out there in the scrum. Yeah, it's interesting, Dan. The, the, I've shared this with a couple people locally. Um, obviously, not on on a broadcast like this, but. Um, this idea actually came to me in a dream. Um, I tend to think it was a whisper from God, but uh, everybody can interpret that however they choose to. Um, the whole idea of the flies literally came to me in a dream and I woke up, um, I don't know, 3.30, 4 o'clock. I'm one of those guys that keeps a pad by my bed and um, I like to be able to write down ideas and things when they come to me. And I literally wrote down the word fly just as, as a remember. And I woke up the next morning and started writing. Um, and I had this, you know, a hundred rewrites later to get to the finished product. But um, the idea literally came to me in a dream. And and, and the whole underlying purpose um, was simply to maybe nudge the reader. Um, it, it's, it's my belief. I'd love to hear your take because I know quite a bit about your background. But it's my belief that everybody's got something inside of them that they want to do that they haven't done yet. Yeah. Um, and the purpose of this book was to hopefully be that nudge that could get them to to fly um, and start that journey. Um, so hopefully that answered your question a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's so true. I, I think, you know, um, so many people, like you said, they, they want to, they want to do that, but they're just scared, you know, to take that leap. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think y you do have to come to a point in your life where you just take the step and, and you don't know, if that drop's going to be eight inches and you're going to land softly on the next step, or maybe it's going to be eight feet or a hundred feet and you might fall and get banged up a little bit. Um, but if you can still pick yourself up and, and take the next step, uh, I think that's, that's a important lesson to, to learn, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, and you know, part of the reason that, you know, Sandy and I are doing what we're doing is just that, you know, exact same concept you know it's like you know what what brought you to sell your house and all your stuff and jump in an rv and, and just start traveling and um you know obviously a lot of it was just inspired by my mom doing what she did you know similar to what we're doing now 
Um, and, and I was, I was happy with where I was at, you know, but there was still, you know, again, this kind of greater calling, you know, like, like you said, you know, God speaking to you, you know, giving you more inspiration. I mean, I had published my first book in 2012. Uh, I felt that it wasn't quite finished yet. So I added 10 chapters and republished it in 2021. And I was just kind of getting this urging that it was time to, you know, close that chapter running a youth sports organization that I'd done for 30 years of my life and, and start a new one and just, you know, do more writing and, and, you know, more speaking and, um, you know, be able to impact even more people, which again, with the work that we are doing, uh, you know, with big vision foundation and the, the kids lives that we were changing at that point, it was, it was a tough pill to swallow because, you know, it wasn't like I was in a corporate dead end job, you know, I was, I was very happy. I loved what I did, loved what I did to the last day I did it. Um, but there was still this calling that there's, there's something more. And I think that's when it's tough for people to take that leap. I mean, when you're pushed, you know, almost to a point of you have nothing to lose, then it's a little easier. Cause you're like, who cares? You know, doesn't matter. I, I hate what I'm doing now. If I take this leap and fall on my face and get bloodied up, who cares? But when you're in that comfort zone, you know, where you're doing good work, that's, that's the difficulty in, in taking that leap. And that's what I, you know, love about the storyline is that, you know, it can change. And, and even just, you know, the, all the things you've done in your life and, you know, the, the kind of, you know, you're, you're a real estate agent by vocation, but then you're doing all this other stuff as well. Um, co-produced a film. We didn't even talk about that yet. Um, you know, so what, you know, throughout your life, what was it that made you kind of venture into some of these other areas of, you know, quote unquote, you know, maybe not your expertise, you know, yeah. but wanting to, to go out and say, hey, you know what, let's co-produce a film. Let's, let's write a book. Um, you know, what brought that on? Yeah, I, I love it, Dan. And, and and talk about the synchronicities of the universe working here um, minutes before uh, getting on this call. And you and I, as you know, only chatted a minute or two before we went live. Um, but I was literally talking with a former Penn State baseball player, interestingly enough, a pitcher by the name of Chris Rayberg. And we were talking about my new book, the, the not the one we're going to talk about here, but the one I just finished writing. Um, it's called 32 and 0 Lessons from an Undefeated Season. And, and in that book, I talk about um, how my coaches, starting with Mr. Buss, taught us to to go for it. He taught us part of his coaching philosophy was to make mistakes, and and then and then he was a teacher. He was an educator. We would learn from those mistakes and and hopefully never repeat them and 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 grow. And um, so from a pretty early time, starting with my parents through my coaches, um, I've always had a mentality to go for it, um, to 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 swing away big, if you will. Um, knowing that sometimes it's going to work and, and a lot of times it's not. Um, so yeah, I mean, many of these ventures are done with, with faith. Um, I've grown a, a, a deep feeling that, um, I do have confidence in the things I'm doing, but there's never guarantees. And, and I think if we want to be a, be a part of the life that, uh, that's meant for us that, that we need to, we need to swing that bat. We need to, we need to go for it and, and, uh, and commit to it. Um, I don't know. I'm rambling a bit. No, I don't, I don't think you're rambling on And I think that's so true. And it's, it's funny because we're, we live in a culture today where, you know, parents become so protective of their children and, you know, don't want to allow them to make a mistake. And it's like, you know, man, like that, that's how we learn, you know, like that's how we learn. And, and I'll never forget something my mom told me when, you know, when I was a, a father and, and, uh, you know, she'd said, you know, God only requires us to do two things for our children and that's teach them how to walk and how to walk away. And she mm -hmm. said, and the second one is a hell of a lot tougher than the first one. Mm -hmm. And that is so true because as parents, we want to protect our kids. We don't want them to get hurt. We don't want them to scuff their knees or get their tooth knocked loose or anything like that. But that's truly the only way that we learn as humans, you know, and, and I think a mistake, you know, isn't really a mistake or isn't really a failure unless you don't learn from it. You know, I think that's I the biggest thing. And, and that's what, you know, 
that's what sports teach us, you know? I mean, if, if you're, if you're a defender in the soccer field and, you know, and you get beat, like you got to learn from that and figure out how to not let it happen again. You know, if, if you make a bad pitch as a, a pitcher on the baseball field, again, you got to learn from that. Um, and if you don't, then that's when I think you truly actually, you know, fail. So, you know, I, I love that, that fact that, you know, you got to be confident enough to take those risks, but you also can't be consumed with the potential failure. You know, it, it is it's what it is. Dan, it's interesting. Sorry to cut you off there. No, it's no. Interesting. I was just, I do a lot of reading. I love reading. And um, I was just reading a book. I think it was You Unlimited um, was the name of the book. Um, last name of the author was Lundy, L-U-N-D-E. Anyway, I believe that's where it came from. Um, but the quote, as close as I can remember, was something about, it said, fear, fear or failure both require us to believe in something unknown but the choice is yours, give or take a word or two. And I, I just loved it. It's, 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 you know, again, one, they both start with the letter F, but fear or failure. And it's, it's, um, or, or sorry, it, it's, you just have to go for it. Faith. Sorry. I'm sorry. Faith. Faith or failure. Faith, yeah. or, or faith or fear. Sorry. Okay. Faith or fear. Both start with the letter F and it's, it's basically our choice. You know, are you going to have faith in something or are you going to be fearful? And, um, you know, again, the, the fearful part of it in, in, in getting, is the part that keeps people on the table. <laughs> it keeps people on the table and keeps people from flying. So yeah, I'm all, I'm all about whatever that means to any individual, um, having that faith to go for it and, and to fly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I did a podcast probably a little over a year ago now with a woman by the name of Amy scrub scrubs. And, um, she, uh, she released a song called what if it all goes right. Mm -hmm. And okay. it, it was, you know, the whole theme behind that song is like so many times we get caught up in if we make this decision, what could go wrong? Yeah. You know, yeah. but if we start thinking about what if it all goes right, like how does that just change our our mindset? You know, and it's one of the things I want to kind of, you know, lead into now is, is uh, you know, you're a very positive thinking sort of guy and just talking about that whole that whole mindset, you know, and, and I've seen you again, interact with kids at camps and stuff like that. And, and everything is positive, everything, you know, and you mentioned earlier that you're always very confident in yourself, but I think part of that is just a positive mindset. So, you know, what, what is it that just keeps you in that positive mindset? Cause again, we can all get caught up in our own negativity yep. so, so quickly. So what are some of the things you do to, you know, kind of practice staying in a positive mindset? Yeah, it's been something, Dan, I, I, I share this a lot. It's, it's been a journey, um, which again, I love the fact that we're on a podcast with that word. And um, it's been a journey of, of learning and of evolution. And um, as great as the programming I had from, from a little kid, from my parents and some of the youth coaches and coaches, um, you know, I was just like everybody else. And that's the part that I drive home with everybody I talk with is don't think for a second that I haven't had my doubts and my, my times of my life where I questioned things and wasn't sure. Um, I did, but, but then what I did is I intentionally, um, went out looking for it. Um, I mentored with people. I, I did an amazing mentorship. I was coaching at Moravian college at the time, now Moravian university, and I did a mentorship with a guy named Bob Proctor, who has since passed, but uh, most people still have never heard of him. He, he was ridiculously successful in the field of peak performance way before it was a thing. Um, a Canadian guy, he was in the movie The Secret, if people know that one from way back when. He was yeah. the first person in that gray-haired gentleman. And I did a one-year pay-to-play mentorship with him and uh, just learned the value and, and the importance of of looking for that positive information and, and feeding yourself with it. I mean, I'll give you an example for the last 25 years, every day I wake up, I wake up, my feet hit the ground. And the very first thing I say, and, and in the beginning, I had to force myself to do it. Now it's autopilot. It's like brushing my teeth or combing my hair. I, my feet hit the ground. And I just say, today's going to be a great day. 
that's the way I start my day. And and is every day great? No, <laughs> you know, I still have bad days. You know, it's not one of those magic pill things, but but the odds go up drastically in, in getting what you're looking for. And, and it's a great way to start the day. Um, you know, literally, today's going to be a great day. And, and if that's your mind frame, more times than not, that's what you're going to find. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that is so important is, yeah, we're still going to have those bad days. Uh, there's nothing we can do about that. Like it just, it happens. Life mm -hmm. happens. But I think one of the things that, you know, again, sports teach us teaches us is you know the fact that you know there's there's things on the field that we can control and there's things on the field that we can't control mm -hmm. and you know you need to learn whether it's in sports or whether it's in life to control the controllables so you know on the soccer field if if the you know if the referee misses a you know an offsides or misses a you know, a foul or something like that, or umpire misses something on the baseball field, you can't control that. However, you can control how you react to that, you mm -hmm. know? And I think that's so important. And, you know, again, in sports and life and, you know, I think if we as humans, you know, really focus on our reactions to the bad stuff that happens to us, you can always get through it. And, and that's, you know, certainly easier said than it's done. You know, I, yeah. I get that, but I, I think you still have to go into it. Like you said, with that, it's a great way to start your day, you know, to say, Hey, it's going to be a, a, a great day. Um, but then to put it into practice throughout the day, you know, as perhaps a deal falls apart, you know, for something beyond your control. So how, how do you, you know, keep it into practice throughout the day. And and again, I know it's not per like, you know, yeah. that's the thing I, I want people to understand. Like, it's not like people are in that positive mindset. Like, like, it's not like nothing ever bothers us. Like, like yeah. we're still human beings at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's interesting. And, and again, well, I'm not preaching this to anybody. This is just some of the things. And I like, I'm a pretty simple guy at the core. Um, through my mentorships and reading and, and studying with people, um, a statement that I just live by is there's two things that I have complete control over, two, my own thoughts and my own actions, period. And, 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 and again, you can take that off and there's other layers of it, but at a foundational level. So it, it, it makes it kind of simple um, and brings it to a, to a simple part. So you lose that deal. Okay. You know, whatever. If it's done, over, you swing the bat and strike out. You take a shot in soccer and miss. Done and over with. Now what? So how am I going to respond to that? I'm in control of how I choose to respond to that. And 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 some of the mechanisms I've learned um, and that I share with people now is when those things happen, because they still do every single day. I, if I'm honest, they're, they're, every day there's something that doesn't go the way I want it. My own mechanism, and, and I don't know if this will come across on the video, but internally i literally visualize that activities in my conscious mind i say next which is i'm releasing it and getting rid of it and then i want i've created a vacuum and now i want to re replace it with the polar opposite so lost that deal i'm a great salesman i'm going to sell the next house the next customer needs me the next customer is going to lead to a sale and just to get my vibrational energy back to what i'm looking for and it's real easy to keep the focus on what we don't want. <laughs> you know, something bad happens and, and you know, people spin out of control and that's all they're giving their energy to. And it's, it's again, just awareness, becoming aware of it. For me, I, again, I literally say the word next inside my head. I go next, replace it with some, the polar opposite of whatever that situation is and, and get back to a state of love and gratefulness and I move on. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I, I think you know, one of the thing, the key things you said there is that it becomes a practice, you know? So again, it's, it's just like on the field, you know, you have to keep doing things over and over the correct way so that it becomes muscle memory at that yeah. point. And it's, you know, it's the same in, in life. Like it's, it's a practice. You have to practice it. It doesn't come naturally. Like you really do have to Put it into practice and you know i think as we start to get in our you know later years of life you know we can we can reflect back and and use that a little bit more um but 
you know, I think for younger people, um, it's a little bit tougher just because they don't have that experience that, you know, so as much as we would love, you know, a 20 something who might be listening to this, uh, it, it goes back to kind of that, you know, teach them how to walk and how to walk away sort of thing. Like you're still going to take your lumps and, and you're never going to become perfect. You're, you're, it's always a work in progress. Um, always, you know, you always got to be willing to learn. Like I know, you know, in my later years of, of coaching, you know, I'd continue to go to coaches clinics all the time. And, and, you know, a lot of times people would, you know, would ask me, you know, like you've been coaching 25 years, 20, this 20, whatever, um, you know, it's like, well, cause I haven't figured it out, you know, yeah. like, I, th I think I'm a pretty good coach, but there's always, you know, something to learn. And, and you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times where, you know, through your studies and reading and just personal development. And I, I think, you know, for me, um, also coming from a sales industry in my past, I, I would always go into any of those, you know, seminars or anything like that with kind of the thought process of like, they're kind of, they're kind of laid out as though this is the blueprint. Um, yeah. but it's not, it's yeah. like, I always took it as if I can get one or two things out of this person's blueprint and use it to mine. Cause again, we're all individuals. So yeah. I could come out and, and lay out, you know, 10 things that work for me and you could be like, okay, I like those two things or those three things very few times are people going to be like, man, I agree with all 10 of those things. I'm going to apply them to my daily life. That's just not the way it, it works. And I, and that would be one of the things that would frustrate me in youth sports, any sports where coaches would approach things with this like cookie cutter, you know, approach. And it's like, you know, these kids are all individuals. They all, all have their own types of personalities, their own, you know, unique way they respond to things. And, you know, you're not coaching. I mean, you're coaching a team as a unit, but then you're coaching X amount of individuals and trying to figure out, you know, some of them you got to be very gentle with some of them respond to tough love, you know, and, you know, so what for you, what was it that kind of made you appreciate the, the individualism of, you know, of just Damn. people in general? Yeah, I, I love that you're bringing this up. It's not a topic that many people catch. <laughs> um, you know, again, it, it's a team sport and, and this and that. And, and so, so I'll simply say this is is I echo what I believe you just said, that uh, there's a lot of people that think, um, I'll do the quote around that word, think they've figured it out. Um, you know, like I said in my intro, I'm I'm a student. I'm a 60, 60 going on 61 year old student right now. Um, yeah, I, like you, I think I'm a great coach. I've learned a lot of things. I know I can help people and share a lot of what I've learned, but um, it's a never ending journey of, of, of figuring this out. And part of it was I always look and, and when I talk with coaches, because I do some work coaching coaches, um, and I always ask them, I said, you know, think about the things that that you liked. I mean, you know, everyone feels good when a coach pulls them aside and compliments them. Everybody. I've never met a person who doesn't like that. But then each kid's wired differently and each kid's goals are different. You know, one kid might want to be a pro soccer player. Another kid, he's doing it just to run around with his friends. And, and you just simply can't coach those people the same. And, you know, my, my take on it, and this is where it takes some work, Um if you're going to be in that role, and I love volunteer coaches, I will never have a bad thing to say about anybody who volunteers for anything. But if you're going to do it, then dig in, dig into the individual kids. You know, sometimes it's as simple as a question, you know, asking a question and then really listening to their answer and, 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 and ask them what their, what their, what their goal is. What is it that you want to do? And then can you find a way to help them, whether it's you personally or, or thinking of a book or, or passing on to another mentor, or, you know, there's always a way to help if you're looking for it. So um, I just think it's an investment. You got to, you know, that has to be what you want to do um, to help someone else. And and I love that part. I always have. Yeah. And, and I love, you know, what you said there about volunteer coaches. I think, you know, if you're going to do it, do it right, you know, and educate yourself a little bit because, you know, you, whether you want to or not, you're making an impact on those kids. It's either going to be a positive impact or a negative impact. And I've told this story a couple different times um, on the show. I mean, I'll never forget this. Um, and, and again, I always approach coaching 
is that it was bigger than the game. It wasn't just about teaching the, the X's and O's. It was about teaching life lessons and stuff like that. And back in the early 2000s, I had the opportunity to go to San Antonio, Texas to speak at the National Alliance of Youth Sports uh, Convention. And with, you know, me being a speaker there, there was, you know, I also could attend every other event that was going on. And the, the main keynote speaker for that event that year was Emmett Smith. And I'll never forget this, you know, my entire life is, uh, he went up there and he talked about, you know, the coach that had the greatest impact on his life. And it, you know, it wasn't, you know, Barry Switzer and it wasn't Jimmy Johnson. It was his first pop Warner football coach. I wish I could remember the gentleman's name at this point, but like right then, even though I kind of, I had this philosophy, like it just hit me like, wow, you know, here's a guy who, you know, made it to the pinnacle of his sport at the professional level, hall of famer, leading rusher. And the coach that made the greatest impact on his life was the first coach that he was on the football field. So, you know, those people out there who are, you know, U eight coaches and stuff like that, you know, like it's a big deal. Yeah. Like it's a big deal. So don't go into that thinking, well, it's just U eight soccer. You know, it's just T ball. It's just Pee Wee football, Pop Warner football. No, it's much, much larger than that. And that that was the thing that drove it home. You know, like I said, I'd, I'd already believed it, but that really was like, yeah, this is a this is a big deal. The impact you make on these people's lives um, is is a big deal for sure. So, you know, when you when you sit sit back and reflect on what your legacy is. Uh, at, whether as a coach or, or an author, um, you know, what do you think that looks like? It's a, it's a great question. <laughs> um, my legacy, as I've as I've thought about it, because I have, um, you know, and I think man, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but again, 61. I hope I have another 60 to go, but you never know. Um, I'd like to think my legacy will live on. Um through the people I've touched, um, starting, I guess, with my family and my kids, but the thousands of kids that I've coached um, and mentored. And, you know, I'm, I'm working with some pretty high level athletes right now at the college level and national team levels. And, um, you know, to I like this process. And and, and I know you, you've mentioned this somewhere, Dan, I, I'll give the credit to you because I don't remember where, but I know I've, I've heard you say this or, or read it somewhere, but it's I'll, I'll credit you on this. It's the coach who's passed it along to us coming through us and on to someone else that we're sharing with the kids and those kids are going to share it again. Um, and and yeah. that's where the legacy is, is it's my belief anyway, you know, it's, it's infinite, it's infinite energy, it's infinite wisdom. That's just going to, it literally is never going to leave this planet. Um, as long as there are people on this planet, your message and my message and the message of our coaches is, is going to be here. So I would hope that my legacy can be a tiny little piece of that. Yeah. And I love that. And yeah, that, that is so true. I mean, your, your legacy is part of coach Buss's legacy and is part of yeah. coach Barr's legacy and part of your father's legacy. And uh, yeah, I, I think that is, is so important. And actually I, I did speak that in the last chapter of my, uh, of my first book and, you know, where yeah. I did actually speak about legacy in general, because I do think that's something we, we think about quite a bit. And I think, I think as human beings, we have multiple legacies, you know, I think we, you know, none of us have just one legacy, you know, it's, it's like what, what you said, individually, our legacies are going to be different for every person that we we've ever interacted with, you know, how they remember us. Like that's literally our, our legacy. So we'll, you know, we'll ultimately have thousands and thousands of legacies at the end of our life. And it's just my, my own personal hope is that there's more positive legacies of me than negative. Cause I'll guarantee you there are negative legacies of me. Like yeah. there's no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and from an outside perspective, I got to jump in here. I'm well, a hundred percent positive that your numbers are well on the, on the side of positive ones compared to the negative. So you're being a little modest there, but I, I get the message. The message is a great one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's shift back to, uh, to writing. Um, you, uh, like I said, you published the first book, you got a second one, uh, 
in in the works or is it finished and just in the touch up process He's writing it's in a, yeah. a final edit right now and still some some artwork cover and that kind of stuff that you're well aware of but yeah the writing is is done just some some minor it's, like i said been through the full ringer of rewrites and re-edits and a final edit uh, right now so i would think early to early 2024 sometime that one should be should be coming out nice so what what did you learn throughout the writing process because you know again i think a lot of people you know writing it's one thing you know and then you go through like you said a couple different edit processes um you know you've you've self-published as, as i did you know so that that's a whole different you know can of worms in its own right and a learning process there as well and then um you know marketing it and selling it you know yeah. is a whole nother component and they're they you know they're all steps in the process but i think someone who's out there who hasn't gone through it probably really doesn't understand when they're holding you know uh, a finished product a finished book whether it's independently published or you know published through simon and schuster or something like that everything that that goes you know into that so what what were some of your biggest surprises through that process and what were some of the things you're like okay i totally expected this yeah, not many of the totally expected this, but the surprises were numerous. Um, the the biggest one was again a, a life lesson that that I that I knew in other things, and for some reason I I didn't know until I got in the is is how collaborative it would end up being. How how many other people? How many other voices? Um, again, I wrote it. I'm the author. It's my idea. Well, <laughs> it's an idea that came through me um, that I put on paper, but, you know, help with with the artists, help with the cover designer, help with the editors. My wife is a ridiculously good editor, so she does most of my initial editing, um, you know, but the, then then I was blessed. Hopefully I can mention this. Um, a good friend of mine, Travis Berger, um, who played soccer at Penn State younger than I is a big administrator, a teacher at Alvernia University. And Alvernia has a thing called the Opaque Center. Um, it's a, a center for business and entrepreneurship. And Travis put me in touch with Michelle Conway, uh, who runs the the uh, Opaque part of things. And, and I got five people, I got a team put together to help me with all the non-writing stuff. Um, so all of the illustrations, the cover, the all of that was a collaborative effort. It was my idea. It was multiple, you know, hundreds of meetings, um, you know, ideas, rewrites, redrawings. Um, you know, you've been through it, but it's it's I think one of the things that the person who picks it up that would have no idea of is is, you know, I think people have this idea that you sit down and, and now I'm dating myself, sit down at your computer or typewriter, I was about to say, <laughs> and, and type this thing out and then take it to the bookstore. You know, yeah, I you know it just doesn't work that way. There's a million steps in between, a million rewrites. And, um, you know, and then at some point in time, like I did with my movie as well, at some point in time, it's it's done and you got to you got to share it with the world. So I, I, I think the amount of work that's required. And again, we talked about this earlier in sports and in life. It's no different. I mean, it's it's if you want that prize, which I did, um, I poured myself into this book and, um, you know, then you got to be willing to do what it takes to get there. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you have. I have hundreds of people, if not thousands who I've heard say, Oh, I've always wanted to write a book, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> do it, <laughs> you know, let's go. Yep. <laughs> What's keeping you from it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, put the first word on paper and then, yeah. and then go from there, you know, and, and it doesn't matter how long it takes you, you know, like just start writing. I mean, like a lot of times I'll get that, you know, when I'm doing a book signing or something, you know, people come up, they're like, Oh, you know, I've always wanted to write a book. This is inspiring. You know, that I'm here talking to someone who's published and it's like, we well, just start writing. You know, like just just start writing. And, you know, I, I talk often about, you know, my first book came out in 2012. That was nine years. You know, that was a nine year process. And again, I was working, you know, working full time at that point um, and, you know, running the the organization as a volunteer. Um, you know, so so time was not something that was a huge asset to me at that point. Um you know, so yeah, it took, it took nine years to, to do that. And then, you know, to ultimately end up adding 10 new chapters to it and, and republish it in 2021, like I tell people. So ultimately, you know, I'm like, it was like a, a almost a 20 year process to, to get it to, you know, what's on the shelf today. 
Um, so yeah, don't, you know, don't get caught up in, you know, thinking it's going to happen overnight. Cause it's not, you know, I yeah. mean, you may go months without writing. Um, hopefully that's not the case, but you know, sometimes it is, but you know, just, just get out there and write and, and do it. Um, you know, not, not to give Phil Knight too much credit, but just do it is a great motto to live by. Yeah. And Dan, I was going to add quickly, you know, it's the kind of thing for me, you know, we all have 24 hours and, and I, I made some conscious choices to shift things that I was doing. So as an example, um, I used to golf a lot. I'm in real estate. We have a pretty flexible schedule. Um, I was golfing three, four times a week. Well, that was six hours a day, four hours for the golf and an hour before hour after I went cold turkey. I'm not telling anyone else should do this, but this is what I did to free up the time to do these things that I truly wanted to do. I stopped golfing. Um, so I still bust my, you know what, as a real estate agent, I still am doing all the other things, but I cut that out of my life. It created the vacuum and those six hours. And this to me is the key part. Are you going to actually do it? And and what I did, and I wrote, I wrote, I'm, I'm laughing and I'm going to give a little plug here. 98% of my book, I wrote at Starbucks. Um, I forced myself and got in the habit of going to Starbucks. And when I went to Starbucks, I wrote. I put my headphones on and 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 typed away and and literally some days it was a half hour, some days it was four hours, some days I forgot lost track of time and it was six hours. Um, but that's every day, you know, and, and I love the way you said just start writing, write a few words. Every day I wrote. Every day for nine months I wrote. Um, you know, and and I think there's a life lesson to be learned in there. If you're if you if you're if you're committed and you just chip away, that compounding effect over time can lead to great things. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's important. It's funny, you know, we were in Key West a couple of years ago, and that was one of the things that Hemingway did is he he wrote every single day from, I forget now if it was from 6 to noon or 6 to 10 in the morning. Wow. Um, but literally, you know, he had an office off the, the one wing of his house. So he'd get up early in the morning, walk to his office and and just write. And he blocked out that time to write and approached it, you know, as a job, so to speak. And And I'm sure there are many times there where, you know, within that four or six hours that he had allotted to, to writing where he may have only written a page or two, you know, yeah. but he was still committed. And I, I did a podcast with another author a little while ago and it was the same way. He says he writes every day and he says, sometimes like I'll write something that just never gets published. Like it, I just trash it, you know, two days later, maybe immediately when I'm done, I just delete it. So it was, you know, it was crap. I'm done with it. But I still, at least I wrote, at least I wrote something. Um, and I think when you get into that, that practice is, uh, is probably a turning point for, for sure. So do you have any more, you know, outside of the next one, any plans for book number three or four down yeah, the road? Yeah, I've actually, now you're, now you're digging deep. <laughs> I should have expected this. Um, I've, I've written five. Um, so I actually am all well along the way of five, five books. Nice. Um, you know, some, some further along than others, but, uh, yeah, I mean, as I told you, journalism and writing has been something I've loved my entire life. And, um, I'm now at a point where again, real estate is my full-time gig, but the time that I used to golf and, and do some other silly stuff, I, I now put into this business and, and this part of my life. And it's, it's my passion. Um, I, I love helping people and, and I think I can help people through my books. I know I can help people through my real estate practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm still writing every day, Dan. I, I, it's, it's become one of those other habits that um, if I can quickly share a mentor of mine, and this is something for anybody listening, and, and you may have heard this already, but it's powerful if you grasp it. A mentor of mine talked about the power of one hour a day. And he said, if you can commit yourself to one hour a day for an entire year, that's equivalent to nine 40 hour work weeks, wow. 365 hours. If you, one hour a day, if you can get committed is it, and then, and then nine 40 hour work weeks, think of what you can accomplish in nine 40 hour work weeks. And again, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take that right. full year of commitment, but that's you know, one of the things with all the athletes I work with is that are serious about it is you got to carve out at a minimum, carve out that hour at whatever it is for you, whatever that thing is minimum one hour a day and commit to it and non-negotiable. I'm going to, that's, I'm doing that. Um, and again, if you do that for one year, two year, three year, four years, you're just going to separate yourself from the pack. And there's so many examples out there. This isn't my information. Again, this is passing along something that I learned, but 
you just see it happen when people start doing that, they start separating themselves and, and people from afar go, Oh, how did that happen? Well, it happened because they committed to their craft every day. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. Love that. Jerry, we talked about so much. Um, and honestly, this could go on for another <laughs> hour at this point. Um, but you know, got to, got to rein it in at some point, but is there anything that, that we missed that you think would be important for the listeners to, to hear before we wrap things up? Yeah, I think that the only thing my encouragement and we have hit this, but but, you know, as far as we know, this is the show, um, you know, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is this is your opportunity at this thing we call life. Um, I love and I'm going to steal from you and in, in what you said in the beginning. Um, what if it all went right? What if it all worked? Um, so whatever that thing is that you've been thinking about, the one that keeps you awake at night, the one that you wake up first thing in the morning and 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 it's you're still thinking about it take action, you know, whatever it is, just, just start today, take some sort of action and, and then stay consistent with it, with a faith and with, with some knowing that you can do it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Jerry, how do people connect with you? Um, get a copy of the book. Um, you know, I don't know. We didn't, we only brushed on, on the movie, but you know, I don't know if it's available streaming or anything like that. I mean, how people find the movie and just, if they want to reach out and, you know, book you for a speaking event or just have a chat with you? How do they find Jerry on the internet? Keep it real simple. The the, the best is my website is simply my name, jerrymoyer.com. And that's Jerry with a J. So J-E-R-R-Y-M-O-Y-E-R.com. Um, most people probably don't do this, but in real estate, everyone also knows my cell. So my cell phone, and I like to be available to anybody, is 610-468-8225. So jerrymoyer.com or my cell phone, and uh, it would be a pleasure to to hear from anybody. Absolutely. Love it. So, Jerry, that brings us to our final question. As you know, the subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, Gloria, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things and the whole world changes. What's one of the little things that Jerry does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place? Yeah, every single day, and I've been doing this for a few decades, um, I consciously, part of my routine as well as I look for an opportunity, at least one throughout the day to to brighten someone else's day in some fashion. Um, simplest thing from holding a door to smiling to buying somebody a cup of coffee to to just telling someone you love their sweater, you know, again, genuine, just stuff, but... but um, I've become someone eternally grateful for, for this experience of life. Um, and 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 I've grown to really love the word love. Um, so I look for every opportunity to spread love um, and 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 optimism with people. I love it. That's a great, great answer. Jerry, I really appreciate you taking the time. For folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com. While you're there, pick up a copy of one of my books and uh, then hop on over to Amazon or Jerry's website, pick up a copy of one of his books while you're at it. Uh, you will not be... You, you will not be disappointed at all. So, Jerry, again, I appreciate you taking the time. Love always connecting with old friends and, you know, people back there in Berks County who, I, you know, it's great to do the podcast with people who I'm just meeting. But when I get somebody, uh, you know, on the show who we already have a relationship with, and I think the listeners will tell there's a, a synergy here. Um, you know, it, it might be a little bit longer of a show, but it's, it's well worth taking the time to listen to the whole thing for sure. So, Jerry, I appreciate you taking the time. Really appreciate you having me, Dan. Thanks so much for doing what you do. You bet. Thank you.